You know, as far as uh, diving into the Word tonight, you know, it was back in uh, the early 80s that I had my first book published. Uh, the original title was Myths the World Taught Me, because uh, one of the things that I discovered after becoming a Christian was there were so many things that I thought for sure the Bible taught that really were the exact opposite of what the Bible taught, you know, things like God helps those who help themselves. You know, I thought that was scripture or to thine own self be true. That's Shakespeare, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so I wrote a book about it. And, and I think if I were going to do a sequel to that book or Myths the World Taught Me 2.0, definitely I would devote at least a chapter to, to this myth that so many people believe. The Bible is a book that was written to make people feel better and to allow them to sleep well at night. <laughs> there, there, there's no way. <laughs> the, the, the more you read the Bible, I think it was Mark Twain who once said, ain't those parts of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that disturb me. And uh, if you can read the Bible for any length of time and not have your personal cage rattled a bit, well, as the kids like to say these days, you're doing it wrong. Uh, because the, the Bible does rock our world. And, and as we get into Hebrews 13 tonight, uh, it reminds me of all of that because, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, I was raised, uh, I was told there were certain subjects that you just didn't discuss in polite company because they tended to upset people too much. Um, two of those subjects are sex and stuff. What did you just say? <laughs> what was what? that? What? Um, yeah, you really don't talk about, uh, first of all, people's sex, sexual lives and, and uh, what goes on with all that. And you don't talk as well about people's personal possessions and what they're doing with them uh, <laughs> or what their personal possessions are doing to them. And yet in our study in Hebrew tonight, in Hebrews tonight, both of those issues are confronted pretty much head on, aren't they? That's right. And, and it's, you know, I was thinking of a title for this for Sean, who's doing our, our kind of all the back stuff, you know, getting it ready for the internet. And it was just, I kind of titled it Love in Action, you know, just because uh, these are areas that really where you see uh, Christian love um, displayed, right? you know, in our sex lives and in our possession life. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is shocking for some people, but God was the one who invented sex. Yeah, right? I mean, and, yeah. And he, and he is very pro-sex. Yeah, and when I read the Bible, Scott, yeah. I was blown away. It was on the second page yeah. <laughs> of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. And, and yet, our sexuality that God has created is a very powerful, but very fragile part of who we are. And if there's ever a subject where you really need to read the owner's manual in order to truly get the most out of this blessing, it's got to be in the area of our sexuality. And, and that's really where we pick things up in uh, verse 4, right? Yeah, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot here. We'll hammer that. Out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this is kind of on myths the world taught me. One of the myths is that uh, the Bible also is a book that is against pleasure. Right. And that is a big myth. And and so we want to look at this passage and kind of break it down and make sure we're, we're getting what it's saying. Because what it's saying is actually very, very radical. Because it starts off and it says, first, marriage is honorable. And that seems like something that we might go, oh, yeah, you know, that, that seems normal. Sure, marriage is on, on, honorable. But, you know, there's many ways in our world where marriage is um, dishonored. You yeah. know, I think of many ways. It's treated it with neglect. It's, um, it's dishonored through adultery. It's dishonored by people living together without getting married. It's dishonored by probably the big one of our day is by redefinition. Right. Yeah. You know? That, that's, that might be something that, to think about as well. Um, so today, it, it can be put that marriage is something that's very hard to, to honor in a lot of ways because 
you know, it seems like there's a lot in the culture that really goes against the idea of honoring yeah, what and, the intent was. And when the book of Hebrews was written, um, it was it was very similar. There were all kinds of wild ideas about marriage. Uh, Cicero, the famous Roman orator, uh, was famous for saying that every man should have, first of all, a concubine in his, his, his life to give him pleasure, a mistress for proper conversation, and a wife to bear him his uh, children and his heirs. Mm. Uh, that was just the general mindset of the average person in Roman culture of, of that day. Uh, conversely, there were individuals that uh, were more Greek in their orientation, and some of them thought that anything that had to do with the physical uh, was suspect, and definitely anything that was pleasurable was something that was definitely uh, a dangerous, if not an evil kind of a thing. There were these individuals called Gnostics mm -hmm. out there that uh, believed that anything that had to do with the physical was definitely not spiritual, and they were making their way into the church. Uh, so much so that in the book of uh, 1 Timothy, uh, we are told in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, that uh, one of the uh, main spiritual attacks against the church is described in this way. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, when we read that scripture, we immediately think that this doctrine of demons is going to be presented to us by someone uh, looking like uh, Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy, coming out in his silk jammies with his pipe, you know, saying, go for it, indulge yourself. But listen to what this doctrine of demon was all, demons was all about. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from, fools, from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now notice what was number one in their marriage. Oh man, if you're really spiritual, you shouldn't get married. That's right, because if you get married, you're going to have sex, and sex is bad and evil, and, and that was the idea. Now, this is something I, I think that's really important with us, in, um, and that is even within the church, when you read church historians, the church fathers, St. Uh, um, Augustine, yeah. um, Augustine. Jerome, Augustine, okay. yeah. Jerome, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think, which yeah. way does Scott yeah. want me to pronounce this? <laughs> um, um, Jerome, different people like that, their, their quotes on marriage are horrible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they thought sex, even within marriage, was a necessary evil. And they were very influenced by, you can see where Plato had an impact on their life, um, stoicism had a big impact on their life and Gnosticism and guilt you know when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, St. Augustine uh, the reason I emphasize that was in my uh, my first day of seminary I signed up for uh, early to medieval church history mm -hmm. and uh, you know I was really intimidated by all these geniuses that I was around I never had any formal biblical training at that point and these People had gone to Christian preschools all the way up through college, and you know they were all loaded for bear. And here I was going, like, "Ooh, boy, I better keep my mouth shut." I sat and was sitting in the back, and you know, there's always one of those people in those classes, you know, the eager beaver, uh, that uh, it just is really not so much there to learn as much as to show off how much they know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one of those guys in the class, and he was sitting up front, and our professor. His name was Dr. Christian, and uh, the, the rumor on Dr. Christian was that when, Abraham, when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, Dr. Christian was there and said, yeah, me too, because he, he, was, he was up there, man. You know, he probably knew he was Augustine, old. He probably knew Augustine personally, but uh, he didn't suffer fools gladly. You know, he was one of those old school profs. I don't know if you remember the paper chase with Professor Kingsley or not, but he was that kind of breed of professor. And uh, this guy in the front row raised his hand as Dr. Christian started his lecture. And he said, Dr. Christian, didn't St. Augustine say this and this and this? And Dr. Christian uh, let him talk. And then he looked at him and he said, young man, 
St. Augustine is in Florida. St. Augustine is in heaven. And we looked at each other and said, are you going to ask him any questions? I'm not going to ask him any questions. <laughs> so, so that's where the St. Yes. Uh, Augustine. But Let me, about let, Augustine, let, just to bring us back uh, from my tangent, uh, you know, <laughs> before Augustine became a Christian, one of his famous quotes was, God, give me chastity, but not yet. He, he lived this incredibly licentious lifestyle. He was a party animal. He was a playboy. And then he becomes a Christian, and you can see how the guilt that he felt about his previous lives really affected and informed his views going forward. Like, well, okay, but sex, it's, it's, it's a necessary evil, but, but you re, you know, if you're really spiritual, you'll be completely celibate. Mm -hmm. And it was his writings that gave rise to uh, the idea of having a celibate, unmarried priesthood within the church. It wasn't something the Bible ever taught, but it was like one thing leading to another, people trying to out-Bible the Bible, uh, people with bad consciences. And if you ever run into someone that is just really loaded for bear uh, as far as one particular issue, they're really, ah, you know, this is the most horrible thing. And ah, they, You know, I, it, it always reminds me of the line from Shakespeare, methinks the lady doth protest too much. Whenever I see people getting all fired up and red-faced about something, it's probably something that's going on in their life mm -hmm. uh, that they either feel bad about in the past or maybe they're lo fighting a losing battle with in the future. But the, the church really got messed up on this whole idea of marriage. And, and the, you know, the writer of Hebrews says marriage is honorable among all. You know, we could compare this with 1 Corinthians 7. Where, you know, the Apostle Paul says, you know, I've got the gift of singleness, but it's better to marry rather than to burn with lust. You know, and, and uh, the, the, the problem is, you know, never build a Bible doctrine on one passage. You know, if you really want to get to see, build your whole understanding of something on just one passage of Scripture. Go for the whole counsel of God's Word. And so we see that balance. And what Paul is saying is, man, you know, it's a persecution city right now. People are suffering. They're dying for their faith. If you can get along without getting married, you're going to save yourself an awful lot of problems. Mm -hmm. But if you got to, you got to. You go, so I, don't, I have this gift of singleness. It's great for me. But everybody's got their own gift. Now, I love the balancing act that we see here in Hebrews. Chuck Smith would say that Paul also wrote this statement. It's like this, this, this cautionary thing, this, this curative from going too far. Hey, 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 marriage is not just okay if you lack self-control, it's honorable among all. It is something that's beautiful among all. An entire book of the Bible, did you know, is devoted not just to marriage, but the celebration of the pleasures of marriage through the sexual relationship. It's the Song of Solomon. Uh, and, and so the, the Bible says marriage is honorable among all. And look at this next line here. What does this mean? The bed is undefiled. Well, I'm glad they say that because this really drives the point home that that sex is something that it, in pleasure is good. It's something God desire, desired or desires, and it's something that is within the nature of God. Um, so when it says like the marriage bed undefiled, it means it's okay. It's okay to be involved in uh, sexual activity. More than just okay. Yeah, it's something that it's we should. It's great. It's great, yeah. right? It's <laughs> something that we should be doing. And um, and I know that's, that's it's so weird because, you know, and that's why I started by saying you have to be careful, you know, kind of what you're getting, what's defining your ideas of sex in life. Because it's very, you know, even in the church culture today, there's a, a gigantic uh, hangover of um, you know, these church fathers teachings where people, when they think of sex, they go, mm, something in them goes, uh, like I like it, but I shouldn't, you know, that kind of attitude permeates into marriages. And it, and, and it, uh, it really, um, you know, it's unfortunate 
because there's a wonderful gift in there. It is undefiled. You know, and I like what that word undefiled means. It's not deformed. It's not debased. Um, it's, it's something that actually strengthens the union. It's something that should be practiced. Um, and and I, I wish more people were, were it, it doing that. I think sometimes it bothers me when, um, you know, I'll, I'll be in counseling and I'll ask people like, hey, how's your intimate life, you know, with your spouse? And they're like, God, oh, we, we haven't been together in four years. And I'm like, wow, you know, that, that's a long time. And, um, and it's, you know, and everybody's different. Don't get me wrong. Everybody's different in their, the way their intimacy, um, you know, and uh, I don't need to get into everything about that, but I just say we're all different human beings and every marriage is kind of different too. Um, but thing is, is, some marriages are so thinking that pleasure is defiling that they don't even, they won't even talk to one another about their intimacy. Yeah, uh, there was a, there's a, a great Christian counselor uh, here in town, Kevin Lehman. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love Kevin Lehman. He almost kicked me out of the U of A my senior year for uh, getting involved in the high, he was the dean of men's students. But uh, uh, he had mercy on me and I, I actually graduated. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he wrote a great book it, it, with this provocative title. It was the name of the title of the book is Sex Begins in the Kitchen. And his whole theory is, and it's a very biblical theory, is that what happens in the uh, act of intimacy between a man and a wife is a reflection of the intimacy they experience outside of all of that. Right. And, and you know, the, it's not that you separate one from another. It's a totality that God wants to bring. And if you're communicating wonderfully in a verbal sense, in an emotional sense, uh, you are, you know, walking in the roles that God has created for a man and a woman in marriage, you know, the, the, the man loving his wife like Christ loves the church sacrificially, uh, the woman following the man's spiritual leadership as the church does Christ. I guarantee you, if you have those things going on in your life, the communication is going to be there. Mm -hmm. the, 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 you're not going to have to walk on eggshells. You're not going to have secrets. You're not going to say, oh, I could talk about this, but it's just going to create a, a, a problem. There's that vulnerability. There's that openness. There's that beautiful trip back to Eden, if you will, where the man and woman were naked and not ashamed. Right. Um, that's where uh, our intimate life should lead. Yeah, and, and your intimate life as a Christian, should lead to um, a hope in future grace. And let me explain that. Is the marriage bed is undefiled because the marriage bed is a picture of heaven in this way. There's two things you're going to experience in heaven, rest and pleasure. Both of those things are taught in the word of God, that heaven will be a place of, of extreme rest for us, we're going to be able to, some of the most amazing passages in the Bible are of this tranquility that we'll have, even with the animals and just nature. Um, and it's very much like an Eden, you know. But then there's that picture of that in before God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. And you get this idea of pleasure being a part of this place that we're going to be at with God as well. And to me, the marriage bed just shines those things. It's undefiled because the intimacy, the covenant between man and woman is a picture of uh, ultimately the picture of Christ in his church. And this picture of rest and pleasure is right there. Yeah. And, you know, we think about our relationship with God and, and in Ephesians chapter five, we don't have time to go into it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Paul makes this remarkable statement that the relationship between a man and a woman is a parallel to Christ and the church. Mm -hmm. And people go, whoa, man, I just don't want to explore that, you know, very, very much. But we shouldn't shy away from it because people that experience a beautiful intimacy in their sexual life in, in, in marriage will tell you that it's not because they read the right books or they went to the right seminars or, or you know, they, they watched the right programs or anything like that. The key 
is trust. Trust. Being in a place where you can be with a person and be totally and completely vulnerable mm -hmm. with that person. Why? Because the Bible told you to and you need to do that. No, you know, one of the, the, the things that, that we emphasize around here is that trust, whether it's on the horizontal or even the heavenly, is an emotional reaction to proven character over time. Mm -hmm. Why do we trust Jesus? Because we look at his life. We look at what he did for us. We look at his death on the cross. We look at him rising from the dead so that he could re rescue and redeem us. When I look at that and I go, yeah, I know you did that, Jesus, so I can trust you with stuff that's going on in my life now, you know, where I don't see how it's all going to turn out. But I trust you because I have that basis of trust there, that proven character over time. And so when we talk about our sexuality and true intimacy, that proven character over time, that trust that you enter into with that other person is really what allows that to become the gift of God. And notice there's, there's a contrast here. Uh, he, said, he says, marriage is honorable among all. The bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Hmm. Okay. Why is fornication, that is having sex before marriage, or adultery, having sex with someone who is not your spouse after marriage, why is God so down on those things? He's going to judge them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it goes back to marriage is honorable. And it's the whole point of why God um, established marriage. You know, if marriage didn't have a meaning, like if there really wasn't an important meaning to it, then it would make no sense why God would be so bummed out at, uh, at our treatment of it. Right. You know, but it has a, an amazing value. There's something about it that is very mysterious in what marriage is. And so, you know, that's why God's going to judge it, because God created it to glorify himself. It is ultimately to glorify him. And we have taken that, and, you know, if you take it and you say, hey, I don't want to glorify God with my sexuality. And I think that's, that's normally what humans, what fallen human beings do, you know, is we take the, I want it to be about me, yeah, not about God. We, well, yeah, we want to own our sexuality. We want to identify the way we want to identify. Um, you know, uh, we have that inner narcissism. And the way we show our inner narcissism most is through our sexual autonomy is by saying, because that's the closest thing to us. You know, that is our, our thing. Right. You know, no one can have this. And, um, and so it's easy for, you know, the, the unregenerate person to rebel from God in that, in that way. Um, they look at it as a, uh, what God created to be a protected protection for human beings, a blessing for human beings. The unregenerate person sees it as like a bad thing. They yeah. see it as a horrible thing. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's, there's sure a lot of subjects we could get into relating to this, but yeah. if we take our sexuality and practice it outside the confines of the one man, one woman, committed together for life relationship God set up that he called marriage, why monogamy? Why, you know, well, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, you should have sex with as many people as possible, and you're going to help uh, spread the species and stuff like that. You know, when, I, when I, I see evolutionists try to explain sex, it, it really shows me how vapid and empty and stupid, in a lot of ways, evolutionism is. It's like I, I read uh, in preparing for this an evolutionist who said, well, you know, uh, we evolved this idea of pleasure, that sex is pleasurable, uh, because that would encourage us to promote the species. Well, how in the world did the species ever get promoted before that? <laughs> what, <laughs> what would ever lead anybody to get involved with sex at all or having kids if there wasn't that pleasurable aspect of it? It was so, really painful at yeah, one point. <laughs> yeah, but we did it anyway because, uh, you know, we had our, our little gathering together as a species, and that's how we're going to get it going. You know, it's like, well, you people need to get out sometime and, and deal with real life. But 
You know, when we see it from God's point of view, notice it says fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Well, you know, God isn't going to strike people with a lightning bolt if they're involved with fornication or they're involved with adultery. But in a sense, those things are their own reward. Right. In Romans 1, God says he has given us over. Right. You know, and, and when I say they're their own reward, this is the deal, and and this is what we really have to come to grips with in our society. Oh, you know, we don't like this at all. But the experience of pleasure and real joy in sexuality, not just physical release, but real joy in sexuality. What we're really looking for in the sexual experience, you know, that that one flesh that naked and not being ashamed uh, situation. You're not going to find that without trust. And if you get involved with fornication, that is you decide, well, you know, my hormones are running amok and I'm going to go ahead and express my sexuality pre-marriage, right? Mm -hmm. What happens at that point? Well, what you're saying to your future spouse is this. You can't really count on me to follow God's guidelines pre-marriage because uh, my behavior is speaking louder than, you know, my, my declarations. I'm saying with my body what I really believe, and that is, man, if it feels good, I'm going to do it in spite of what God has said. And I've always wondered this, you know, the, the people say, well, you know, you've got to try before you buy, you know, you've got to really kind of try this sort of thing out and, you know, sort of see, you know, if you guys are going to be sexually compatible or not, you know, why would you do that? You want to uh, buy a car without taking it for a test drive? Would you? And I, I, I can't believe how low and crude and, and, and dehumanizing that kind of mentality is because, you know, what you're saying is, is that, what I want out of this is so important. I'm going to get what I want when I want it, and I'm not going to put off, say, what I would really like to do at a particular time for your benefit, for, for the, the fact of saying to you, you know, I have a character you can trust in, and here's how you're going to know. You know, it's not that, you know, I wouldn't want to be intimate, but I'm not going to be intimate because I want you to see the kind of person I really am and that I care about you more than I care about me. Boy, you, you make that kind of a stand, you are building trust. And if you don't make that kind of stand, okay, what makes you think that a person who can't follow God's guidelines pre-marriage is going to be able to follow God's guidelines post-marriage? What happens if that person, say, that you get married to, you know, becomes injured or, or crippled or something like that, and they, they can't satisfy your desire sexually anymore. Are you going to be there for that person? Well, that question is always out there. And, and, and once again, when we get involved with fornication and we sort of say, well, I'm going to just go looking around for some kind of intimacy there. You know, the people that I've, I've talked to that have been most involved with kind of a, uh, a, a wide variety of partners pre-marriage is they will say, yeah, you know, it's really hard for me to trust because I don't even trust myself. You know, and, and it, it really is an issue they have to work through. Not that they can't work through it, uh, getting into marriage, but it is a huge issue. Adultery, man, the first victim of adultery is what? Trust. And boy, once that trust is broken, it's hard to get that trust back. Hmm. So, you know, when we talk about our sexuality and we talk about the way that God created our sexuality... You know, we tend to get into the realms more of the physical and, and sometimes, you know, even kind of the, the utilitarian, if you will. You know, well, you know, God created this because he wanted strong families and this is how you do the strong family and blah, you know. And yeah, 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 I get all that. But God wants the marriage relationship, like you say, to be a little bit of heaven. Mm -hmm. And how do we get to heaven? It is by grace that you've been saved through what? Faith. Faith, right? Trusting in God, trusting that we can trust him. You know, and, and if we bring that kind of grace and that kind of faith with one another into marriage, I guarantee you, you know, that kind of liberating, uh, not having to keep the guard up, knowing there's one person in this world who's got your back no matter what, uh, that, that, that one person that you can say anything 
to, and you know they're going to accept you, and, and you know they're, they're, they're not going to reject you, and, and so on. To, to be with that one person, to have that kind of trust, boy, that's beautiful. Mm. But we sacrifice that so easily, so on the cheap, if you will, for lesser things that this world says. Oh, just you know, buy into that momentary pleasure over there, and I'm sure everything's going to be fine. Well, we destroy a little bit of our souls mm. every time we do that. Mm. Yeah, so true. Sex certainly has become a commodity in a lot of people's lives, um, and and that's unfortunate. You know, so it's a great passage. I mean, there's a lot of things to go in into with this kind of a passage. A lot of people read this and they feel um, kind of bummed, you know, when they read a passage like this, um, because some people um, and a lot of people within the church environment just are very uncomfortable around the topic of sex, which is really odd to me, um, because sex is the thing that really got me to read the Bible. You know, <laughs> That's um, awesome. yeah. So um, coming coming from my background, you know, when I when I first read the Bible, I was kind of into it. I was like, man, this book's pretty into sex. So I think I'm kind of into it. You know, I'm kind of I like it. And coming from you know the the Hollywood background, I have, you know, um, you know, I was very glad that the Bible talked about this subject. But I, I as I you know started being in this church culture. I started realizing that wasn't the normal attitude that a lot of people, when the word sex came up again, there was a lot of hurt. And maybe there was a lot of, maybe someone's, you know, committed fornication and, and, or adultery. And, you know, and they, they have a lot of guilt there. So now, now it's hard for them to engage in intimacy. They just feel a, a very, like, guilty for coming back into a right relationship. And, and I think it's so important for people to realize that, you know, we can, that God desires to restore the years the locust have, has eaten. He, yeah. he desires yeah. to bring people back to that place where marriage is honorable and it's un, the marriage bed undefiled. Um, and, um, and I think we all have to do a little inventory in our lives and be able to go, hey, what do I think about sex? And, you know, what is my issues with it? And, you know, because it bothers me when a Christian thinks of sex and they go, oh, that's yucky. Like, no, 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 Like, no, you got to get that out of your mind. That's, that's your culture, you know, running in your brain. And that's not the Bible running in your brain. And, and, it, and to me, that creates a whole big problem. You know, when your foundation is like, you know, we, I always say to people, to the men that I've worked with for a long, long time, what what is the first thing you think of when you when you hear the word sex? You know, and they're like, "Oh man, you know what it is," and and it's this and it's that and it's all the cultural stuff, right? You know, and and I say, "Well, why isn't it God?" Like when you hear the word sex, why is why don't you hear God? Why don't you hear God? Why doesn't that come to your mind? Because sex is it has become like a secular thing yeah you know within the church yeah and and i think one of the great deceptions that satan has worked in the church is to say uh, sex this is over for worldly people right you people in the church you know don't don't uh, go near any of this you know right. be over here with augustine and and, and you know work yeah. on your you know, feel guilty and and you know you know get, oh gosh i hope they'd move on to verse five you know and gosh <laughs> you know i just i didn't come here tonight to talk about all of this and right and all of it well you know here's the bottom line and because we run through our time we'll, we'll have to wrap it up here but the best insight into sexual intimacy that i have ever heard and i've seen it to be true in my life um, and, uh, again, you know, I can tell you in, as far as marriage goes, I've been in a situation where I've experienced incredible pain in this area in my first marriage, and I've experienced incredible blessing in my relationship with Pam. But here's the bottom line principle in any relationship you're talking about, any relationship, you can take this to the bank, your relationship with people on the horizontal whether that's friendship, whether that's fellowship, whether that's doing business with people, that whether that's, you, you name it. Your relationship on the horizontal is never going to be 
higher or more satisfying than your relationship in the vertical, mm -hmm. your relationship with God. And when that relationship with God is online, the, the fruit that comes out of that is that all of these blessings that Satan would lock away and say, no, that's not for you, God wants to bring these things and make them a blessing, you know? All, all of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the bad lessons and, and, you know, maybe the pain and the guilt or the betrayals of the past, God wants to pour his amazing grace on and bring freedom and liberation there. And uh, it, it is so sad sometimes how in the name of being godly, people will become separate in their marriages. Like you say, oh, well, the last time we had sex was four years ago. I think that's tragic. That is really, really sad. Unless, of course, there's some extenuating circumstances sure. involved there. Sure. But in a normal marriage relationship, the normal marriage relationship is going to be a reflection of the relationship that we have with God who invented all these things mm -hmm. and created them for our blessings and for our benefit. Yeah, and if you think of God as pleasurable, then all of a sudden you start going, oh, pleasure is good. Yeah. You know, if you start thinking of God as pleasurable, God is a pleasurable being. He sits in the heavens and does whatever pleases him. Right. He's pleased. This right. is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. pleased. Yeah, yeah, not not the, you know, the uh, the cosmic computer in the sky. <laughs> right, right. You know, like, not, yeah. not the, uh, you know, the guy with the long beard and the sneer on his face on a throne with a lightning bolt on it. You know, that's Zeus from Greek mythology. Right. That's not the God of the Bible. Yeah. You know, and, and when we begin to understand how much God loves us and how he has created these things for our blessing and our benefit, um, you know, we don't have to be weirded out about yeah. sex. We don't have to follow the lead of our culture, our pornographized culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we're following in, in the footsteps of Japan, more pornography there than almost the United States. And none of the generation coming up wants to get married. Why? Because there's no trust. It's just mechanical. It's just, you know, these, it, it's exploitative. And that's, what, and that's certainly moving into our culture too. Absolutely. Why people, why this generation, when they think of marriage, they go, man, I'll get married when I'm like maybe 40. Yeah. You know, maybe. Because, yeah. you know, most young people I talk to, they, they go, man, I, I can't, I can't trust. There's no good, you know, if you talk to the guys, they're always like, I, there's no good girls. If you talk to the girls, they're like, there's no good guys. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, <laughs> they're all a mess. But you know? what a beautiful summary statement here that marriage is honorable among all. I guess the challenge tonight we got to ask ourselves is this, do we honor marriage as God created it? Not just a ceremony that you go through where you say, I do, but what God desired marriage to be, this beautiful celebration and, and place of intimacy mm. and, and vulnerability yeah. and, that, that God has created for us. It's honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Yeah, that's when you and, underline. You know, it, it's like, it's not undefiled. just something that I agree on in theory. It's not just something that is spiritual and I go to a wedding in the church and that's what is honorable about me. No, the whole relationship is undefiled. God says, no, that's not sin. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's a preview of heaven. But if you don't want that, you can have this worldly path. You can get into fornication. You can get into adultery. But the number one victim of these things is trust. But even if we've fallen, there's that beautiful, amazing grace of God that comes along and brings healing. Yeah, and I'll just, the last thing I'll say is that I have not done this perfectly. I just want you to know that. Like, as a pastor, I have not done this perfectly. You know, Jesus says if, you, if you've looked at someone in a lustful way, you know, you've committed adultery in your heart. And so you just need to know when you're looking up at, at us, you know, we, we are not like going, hey, yeah, you know, if you've done this, you know, no, in our hearts, man. Or, and and I'm life, divorced. Yeah. So I'm we, divorced we and have, remarried. We so, have not been you know, perfect. Once again, yeah. you know, in some circles, the, the big D is like the scarlet letter. That's you know, right. You're done. Yeah. That's it. And, and, so and, and my background is really interesting. <laughs> I won't get into it, but it's... 
but but it's not about what we're trying to say is it's not about us or that we've got it all figured out yeah it's about what god's word says it's about how much he loves us it's about him it's about jesus it's about getting you ready for heaven that's um, right and that's really it you know we're we're just here to steer you in that direction yeah and, and we can tell you from personal experience that his ways really satisfy they really do work yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when you put them into practice. So, mm -hmm. Lord, thank you so much that we've had this opportunity tonight to talk about uh, such a sensitive subject, but such a beautiful subject, such a wonderful blessing that you've given to us. And God, even as uh, we enter now into this time of waiting on you and praying together, just as a body of believers, allowing your Holy Spirit to move and minister in these next few minutes. I pray, Father, that we would realize that in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And I pray, Father, that in a real special way you might lift us up out of this, this uh, soul-depleting routine that we live in in this day and age and renew us and revitalize us and allow us to be ministered to by you, the one we can ultimately trust. And because we trust you, we can trust each other. Thank you, Lord, that you will never fail us and never forsake us. Thank you, you'll never let us down. And Lord, we do pray for those that have experienced pain and, and fracture in their personal relationships, especially their sexual relationships, that you would come to them and do just a beautiful healing work. Take down the walls and lead them back into Eden where they can, can enjoy the presence of one another as they enjoy your presence as well. In Jesus' name, amen.